everyone, Osiris Frost. On today's show, I'll be talking about my impressions of the newly released ships in Star Citizen now that Patch 3.1 has gone to the PTU. Those ships are the Misk Razor, the Anvil Terrapin, the Apoa Nox Q, the Aegis Reclaimer, and the Tumbral Cyclone, and each of them are currently available for a limited time release sale, so if you've been waiting for a chance to pick one up, now's the time. In addition to discussing my impressions of these ships, I've recently released two guided tour videos for the Terrapin and the Reclaimer, so please go give those a watch if you haven't already. I've linked those videos down below in the show notes. Let's start off with the Razor. I love the look of this ship. I'd go so far as to say that this is the best looking design in the entire game so far. It screams Formula One Racer, and it flies like it too. This thing is fast and agile. I got super pumped about the black and white skins from the commercial that you're watching play in the background right now. The problem, and it's a big problem, is that the cockpit visibility is bad. First of all, you sit very low in the ship, which raises your horizon line. Add to that those orange side panels. It would be unfair to say that they are functionless. Their function is to block your view left and right, like horse blinders. They are literally opaque panels that sit between the pilot and the canopy. This was purely a design choice, and they could have easily been removed, allowing you to look through the canopy and I suspect that they might someday take them out if enough people complain about it. Those panels, however, are not even the most egregious offenders of cockpit visibility on this ship. That title belongs to the HUD radar reflector hood, dead center in your forward field of view. It's so bad that it almost overlaps your targeting reticle. I know that the Razor is not intended to be a dogfighter, and any serious Razor is likely to remove the weapons anyway for reduced mass, but the point is that the ship itself protrudes inconveniently into the pilot's field of view. If you need to pitch down to follow the race course, you're essentially flying blind and hoping for the best. On the most recent episode of Citizen Gamer's Blastcast, Jarrus hilariously referred to the Razor as the Jedi ship because he said you have to be able to use the force to fly it. That's a pretty accurate assessment of where the Misk Razor is currently. It may conceivably be raceable in third person view, but there you lose your HUD, so I'm personally going to recommend against the ship for the time being, with the hope that they redesign some of the cockpit elements to focus on visibility rather than hold to an arbitrary aesthetic. If you disagree and want to get it anyways, it's on sale for $145 store credit or $120 war bond. Moving on to the Anvil Terrapin, this is one of the two ships that I recently released a video tour of. I love the design of this ship, both inside and out, and I was pleasantly surprised that it flew better than I expected. That said, it's not a racer or a dogfighter, but I expected it to be a little more lumbering than it turned out to be, so bonus points there. As for its role, it's a pure exploration craft, incapable of moonlighting as a cargo hauler or anything else, really. Exploration mechanics are still a few months off, so it's hard to enthusiastically recommend a ship that does only that, but I really like what I've seen so far, and based on everything we've heard about this ship, it's supposed to excel in its role. My feeling is that this ship will be an elite exploration vessel, fully worth owning by any serious explorer. It's small enough to fit through any jump point, and has the fuel capacity in bed to operate as a long distance exploration vessel, so I have no concerns about this ship being able to perform as advertised. My only concern here is the cost. At $220 store credit, or $195 war bond, this ship has a shockingly high price tag. When you consider that you can buy several much more versatile ships for less than that, like the Cutlass Black for example, it is a really difficult price to justify, and even if you are willing to spend that kind of money, the Constellation Andromeda is only $5 more than the non-Warbond Terrapin, and it can do so much more. Remember, all of these ships are purchasable in-game for UEC, so the only reason to spend real money to get them at this point is to support the development of the game. That said, I just can't say in good faith that the Anvil Terrapin is the best way to invest that much money in the Star Citizen, but I definitely think it's a ship worth buying in-game someday. Next up is the Tumbril Cyclone. This ship is actually a ground vehicle, but it's a hell of a lot of fun to drive. Add to that the fact that CIG have stated that you can swap the loadout of any cyclone that you have to make it into any of the variants, depending on what your mission requirements are, and this is a very versatile vehicle. Oh, by the way, did I mention that it fits in the back of a Cutlass? At $55 store credit or $40 war bond, this is a vehicle that I would recommend for a new player who is being introduced to Star Citizen by a friend with a Cutlass or Constellation, and who doesn't necessarily know what type of ship they want to own. Maybe they just want to adventure together in the friends ship. Here's a shameless plug. That player could register their account with my referral code and get 5,000 UEC. Then they could buy an Aurora or a Mustang starter pack and CCU that ship to a Cyclone. Or the friend could buy them a CCU as a welcome gift. Whatever. I used to be under the impression that ship-to-vehicle CCUs were not a thing, but I just checked and I was able to put a Mustang Alpha to Tumbrel Cyclone CCU and an Aurora MR to Cyclone CCU into my shopping cart. In any case, the real drawback to the Cyclone is that there just isn't much ground-based content in Star Citizen yet, but that will definitely change in the future. The fourth ship being released with 3.1 is the Nox Q 
which is the silver variant of the already released base Nox. Its only difference from the base model is the skin. This is sure to anger some backers who were told during the Nox's concept sale that the Q was a limited edition skin that would never again be available. Anger was certainly a prominent reaction when CIG did the exact same thing with the Dragonfly Yellow Jacket just a short time ago. I think CIG is clued into the fact that people are willing to pay for cosmetic things in video games, and at the end of the day, Chris Roberts probably just overrode his marketing department in regards to skin exclusivity. They are, after all, a growing company hungry for more cash. Anyway, in 3.0, there were some performance issues with the hoverbike type vehicles to where their physics would misbehave or they would negotiate variations in terrain in unpredictable ways. While I haven't tested this much myself, this is apparently much better in 3.1. They may or may not still be kind of floaty, but I'm optimistic about the direction that the flight model is heading in. Plus, I really like the look of the Nox. If you do too, you can pick one up during the sale for $45 store credit or $40 war bond. The final new ship for 3.1 is the Aegis Reclaimer. I think I've been looking forward to this one more than any other ship announced to date. The Reclaimer represents so much for Star Citizen. It was one of the first, if not the first, announced industry ship. CIG's intention to develop this ship signaled that Star Citizen was meant to be so much more than a dogfighting sim. The design of this ship is an homage to the Aliens franchise, and the fact that Star Citizen is, in some way, influenced by other science fiction that I'm a fan of, layers in subtext about what I can expect the finished game to be. It's also a major milestone for CIG to get such a large vessel in-game, given their ambitions for the scope of Star Citizen. This was an important test with other large commercial and military vessels in the pipeline. After years of anticipation, PTU testers finally got the chance to climb aboard this ship over the past couple of days. If you haven't already checked out my video tour on this ship, definitely take a look and you can see what all the fuss is about. This ship is nearly perfect in every way, from its aesthetic cues to its foreboding ambiance. All of that said, there are a couple of downsides here. Most obviously, salvage mechanics are not yet in-game. We can expect those with patch 3.2, but until then, the Reclaimer is just a big flying paperweight. Another thing that became clear from touring the ship is how many crew stations there are. I know not all of them need to be manned 24-7, but I can envision a lot of people who bought big multi-crew ships having a tough time getting enough people with the same schedule availability and inclination to reliably crew them. That's not that it can't be done, but I certainly expect that it will happen less than big ship owners are counting on. I think the vast majority of players envision themselves as ship captains rather than crew members and pledged for ships accordingly. I expect that it will become apparent as more systems are added to support party gameplay that Star Citizen is suffering from a big case of too many chiefs, not enough Indians. For this reason, I'm hoping that CIG revisit their stance on AI crew members essentially being arbitrarily kept less useful than they possibly could be, but that's a subject for another video. The thing that's really concerning to me and is apparently being allowed to slip through the cracks here amidst all this fanfare, is that the Reclaimer was initially sold to us as including a Cutter. The Cutter is supposed to be a parasite vehicle that could fly out from the Reclaimer and assist with salvage operations. Over the years since the Reclaimer was first announced, not a lot has been said about the Cutter and it's kind of slipped down an Orwellian memory hole, or maybe been shoved there by CIG. I've seen one or two people inquire about this on Spectrum recently, to general apathy. I certainly haven't heard CIG comment on it, and from my exploration of the Reclaimer, it's apparent to me that there is no such vehicle on board. I know that CIG is moving at 100 miles per hour in a thousand different directions, so I don't need this to become a high priority for development, but I do want to be clear that the backers haven't forgotten what was promised. The Reclaimer is available during the sale for $400 store credit or $350 war bond. Aside from those newly flight-ready ships, you can also pick up the Constellation Aquila, the Misk Prospector, and the Drake Dragonfly during the sale. Those three ships have been flight-ready for a little while, so I'm not going to go into them in detail or make recommendations here. Instead, I'll link the sale page for all of the ships I've mentioned today in the show notes below. That's all for today's show. Thanks for watching. If you're new to Star Citizen, or you know someone who's thinking of playing, you or they can earn 5,000 UEC on your account by registering with my referral code which you can find in the show notes down below. If you have any questions, feedback, or episode suggestions, go ahead and leave them in the comments. And if you haven't already, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate that. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.